Chapter Eight of the Silver Princess in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. The Silver Princess in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter Eight. On to Ev. "'Is there any way you can signal to your mount to trot ahead?' inquired Kabumpo, looking down sideways at the Thunder Colt, whose breath was blowing hot and uncomfortable against his side. "'Let Thun be the vanguard,' he suggested craftily. "'When I trumpet once, turn him left. At two, turn right. At three, he must halt.' "'Oh, fine,' approved Planety, tapping out the message with her heel on the Thunder Colt's flank. That will be simply delicious. Thun evidently agreed with her, for tossing his smoky mane he cantered to a position just ahead of the elegant elephant, at which Kabumpo heaved a huge sigh of relief. He did not wish to hurt Thun's feelings, neither did he wish to catch fire again. Here travel Thun, the Thunder Colt, Planety, Princess of Another Planet, Kabumpty of Nas and Slandy King of Segalia, give way, all ye comers and goers, and arouse me not, for I am a seething mass of molten metal. Is he really? marveled Randy, gazing up at the fiery message floating like a banner over their heads. Planety nodded absently, her interest so taken up with the wild flowers below, the blue sky above, and the wide armed, lacy leafed trees of this ancient forest. She could not bear to turn her head for fear of missing something. On her own faraway metal planet skies were gray and leaden, and the various levels of slate and silver strata arranged in stiff and net-like patterns. The gay colors of this bright new world simply delighted her, and Randy and Kabumpo she considered beings of rare and singular beauty. The word she used to herself when she thought of them was netiful which is another way of saying beautiful. A wonder that high-talking Thomas couldn't get a name straight once in a while, complained Kabumpo out of one corner of his mouth, as Thun's sentence spiraled away in thin pink smoke. Oh, what difference does it make, laughed Randy. I think Kabumpty is real cute. Cute, raged the elegant elephant with such a fierce blast, Planety promptly turned Thun to the left. "'Now see what you've done,' snickered Randy, giving Kabumpo's ear a mischievous tweak. "'They think you want them to go left.' "'As a matter of fact, I do,' snapped Kabumpo grumpily. "'We must go east through Ix and then north to Ev.' "'Puzzling and more puzzling,' murmured Planety, looking round at the elegant elephant. "'Where are all these curious places, Bumpo dear? "'I thought all the time we were in Nas. "'Did you not tell us you were the big Bumpo of Nas? Randy peered rather anxiously over Kabumpo's ear to see how he was taking this second nickname, but he need not have worried. The dear Bumpo, spoken in the metal maid's ringing tones, fell like a charm on Kabumpo's ruffled feelings, and fairly oozing complacency and importance, he began to explain his own and Randy's real names and countries hoping Planety would straighten them out in her own head, if not in Thun's. "'You are right,' he started off sonorously. "'Randy and I both live in the land of Oz, a great oblong country entirely surrounded by a desert of burning sand. But in Oz there are many, many kingdoms. First of all, the four large realms, the Gillikin country of the north, the Quadling country of the south, the empire of the Winkies in the east, and the land of the Munchkins in the west. Each of these kingdoms has its own sovereign, but all are under the supreme rule of Ozma, a fairy princess, as lovely as your own small self, and Ozma lives in an emerald city in the exact center of Oz. Kabumpo paused impressively, while Planety's eyes twinkled merrily at his delicate flattery. Now Randy and I hail from the North Gillikin country of Oz, proceeded the elegant elephant, moving along as he spoke in a grand and leisurely manner. I come from the kingdom of Pumperdink, and Randy from the regal little realm of Regalia. 
Only yesterday I arrived in Regalia to visit Randy, and we are now on our way to the castle of the Red Jinn, as I think I told you before. If we were in Oz, my dear, Kabumpo rather lingered over the deer. Ozma and her clever assistant, the Wizard of Oz, would quickly transport you to another planet with the magic belt. But you see, we are not in Oz, for the same storm that overtook you and Thun overtook us, and hurled us across the deadly desert to this kingdom of Ix, where we all now find ourselves. Fortunately, too, for otherwise we might never have met a princess from another planet. The little princess nodded in bright agreement. So, continued Kabumpo, picking a huge tiger lily and holding it out to her, as it is too difficult to travel back to the Emerald City of Oz, we will take you with us to the Wizard of Ev, whose castle is on the Nonestic Ocean in the country adjoining Ix. And a wizard is what? Planety turned almost completely round on her black charger, smiling teasingly over the tiger lily at Kabumpo. Why, a wizard? Uh, er, a, a wizard? The elegant elephant fumbled a bit, trying to find the right words to explain. A wizard is a person who can do by magic what other people cannot do at all, finished Randy neatly. Magic? Planety still looked puzzled. Oh, never mind all the words, comforted Kabumpo, flapping his ears good-naturedly. You'll soon see for yourself what they all mean, and I'm sure Jinnicky will be charmed to do his best tricks for you and send you back in fine and proper style to your own planet. Yes, Jinnicky can do almost anything, boasted Randy, taking off his crown and setting it back very much a tilt. And he's good fun, too. You'll like Jinnicky. As much as Big Bumpo? Planety rolled her soft eyes fondly back at the elegant elephant, and Randy, feeling an unaccountable twinge of jealousy, wished she would look at him that way. Oh, maybe not so much as Kabumpo, of course. There's nobody like him. But pretty much as much, declared the young king loyally. But I like everything down here, decided Planety, leaning forward to tickle Thun's ear with a lily. It's all so night and netiful. So now we know what we are, whispered Randy under his breath to Kabumpo, and wait till Jinnicky sees us traveling with a fire-breathing thunder colt and the princess of another planet. Oh, don't we meet important people on our journeys, Kabumpo? Well, don't they meet us, murmured the elegant elephant, increasing his speed a little to keep up with fun. Though I wouldn't call this colt important myself. How is he any better than an ordinary horse? His breath is hot and dangerous, and it's not much fun traveling with a deaf and dumb brute who burns everything he breathes on. Oh, he's not so dumb, observed Randy. Look at the way he leaped over that fallen log just now, and think how useful he'll be at night to blaze a trail and light the campfires. Hadn't thought of that, admitted Kabumpo grudgingly. I guess he would show up pretty well in the dark, and I suppose that does make him a trail blazer and lighter of the fires for this particular expedition. Ho, ho, carumph, and between you and me in the desert, this expedition had better move pretty fast and not stop for sightseeing. Suppose these two nuthers had that vanadium shower at the beginning of the week instead of the middle. That would give them only about two more days to go. Great goose feathers! I'd hate to have them stiffen up on us halfway to Jinnicky's. I might carry the princess, but what would we do with the colt? Let's not even think of it, begged Randy with a little shudder. Great goopers! Kabumpo, I hope Jinnicky will be at home and his magic in good working order, and powerful enough to send them back, or keep them here if they decide to stay. If they decide to stay, Kabumpo looked sharply back at his young rider. Why should they? Well, Planety said she liked it down here. You heard her yourself a moment ago, and I thought maybe. Randy's face grew rosy with embarrassment. Ha, ha, so that is the way the wind lies, Kabumpo chuckled soundlessly. Well, I wouldn't count on it, my lad, he called up softly. She probably has some night planety prince waiting for her up yonder and will fly away without so much as a backward glance. And as for Jinnicky being at home, 
Why shouldn't he be at home? And as for his magic not being powerful enough, why shouldn't it be powerful enough? He was in fine shape and form when I saw him in the Emerald City three years ago. By the way, why weren't you at that grand celebration? I understood Ozma invited all the rulers of the realm. Uncle Hoochafoo did not want me to leave, sighed Randy. He thinks a king's place is in his castle. I wonder what he thinks now, said Kabumpo, trumpeting three times, for Thun was racing along too far ahead of them. Probably has all the wise men and guards running in circles to find me, giggled Randy, immediately restored to good humor. And say, when I do get back, Old Push the Foot, I'm going to be king, and everything will be very different and gay. Yes, there'll be lots of changes in regalia, he decided, shaking his head positively. Why, all those dull receptions and reviewings would tire a visitor to tears. Ho, ho, so you're still expecting her to visit you? Waving his trunk, Kabumpo called out in a louder voice. Not so fast there, princess. Hold fun back a bit. We might run into danger, and we should all keep together on a journey. Besides, Kabumpo cleared his throat apologetically, Randy and I must stop for a bite to eat. Planety's eyes widened, as they always did, at strange words and customs, but she tugged obediently at Thun's mane, and the Thunder Colt came to an instant halt. Randy himself tried to coax the little princess to eat something, but she was so upset and puzzled by the idea he finally desisted and tried to share his bread and eggs with Kabumpo. But the elegant elephant generously refused a morsel, knowing Randy had little enough for himself, and lunched as best he could from the shoots of young trees and saplings. Thun was so interested when Kabumpo quenched his thirst at a small spring that he too thrust his head into the bubbling waters, but withdrew it instantly and with such an expression of pain and distress, Randy concluded that water hurt the Thunder Colt as much as fire hurt them. He was quite worried till the flames began to spurt from Thun's nostrils, for he was afraid the water might have put out Thun's fire, and hastened the time when he should lose all power of life and motion. "'Do you do this often?' inquired Planety, as Randy tucked what was left into one of Kabumpo's small pockets." eat? Randy laughed in spite of himself. Oh, about three times a day, or light, he corrected himself hastily, remembering Planety had so designated the daytime. I suppose that vanadium spray or shower keeps you and Thun going, the way food does Kabumpo and me. Planety nodded dreamily, then seeing Kabumpo was ready to start, she tapped Thun with her silver heels and away streaked the Thunder Colt, Kabumpo swinging along at a grand gallop behind him. Strange we have not passed any woodsman's huts, nor seen any wild animals, called Randy, jamming his crown down a little tighter to keep it from sailing off. Hi, watch out there, old push a foot. There is a wall ahead stretching away on all sides and going up higher than higher. What's a wall doing in a forest? Perhaps it shuts in the private shooting preserve of Queen Zixi herself. Say, eh, hey, I'd like to meet the queen of this country, wouldn't you? No time, no time, puffed the elegant elephant, giving three short trumpets to warn Planety to halt Thun. Great gump, whoever built this wall wanted to shut out everything, even the sky. Can't even get a squint of the top, can you? Is this the great kingdom of Ev? asked Planety, who had pulled Thun up short and was looking at the wooden wall with lively interest. No, no, we're not nearly to Ev. The elegant elephant shook his head impatiently. Back of this wall lives someone who dotes on privacy, I take it, or why should he shut himself in and everyone else out? Now then, shall we cruise round or knock a hole in the wood? I don't see any door, do you, Randy? No, I don't. Standing on the elephant's back, Randy examined the wall with great care. Why, it goes for miles, he groaned dolefully. Miles. Then we'll just bump through. Backing off, Kabumpo lowered his head and was about to lunge forward when Randy gave his ear a sharp tweak. Look, he directed breathlessly. Look. 
While they had been talking, Thun had been sniffing curiously at the wooden wall, and now a whole round section of it was blazing merrily. Hooray! He's burned a hole big enough for us all to go through, yelled the young king gleefully. Come on! Vexed to think the Thunder Colt had solved the difficulty so easily, and worried lest the whole wall should catch fire, Kabumpo signaled for Planetty to precede him. But he need not have worried about Thun's firing the wall. The Thunder Colt had burned as neat a hole in the boards as a cigarette burns in paper, and while the edges glowed a bit, they soon smouldered out, leaving a huge circular opening. So, without further delay, Kabumpo stepped through, only to find himself facing the most curious company he had seen in the whole course of his travels. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of The Silver Princess in Oz This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. The Silver Princess in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter 9. The Boxwood. Why, why, they're all in boxes, breathed Randy, as a group with upraised and boxed fists advanced upon the newcomers. Chilliwalla, Chilliwalla, yelled the boxers, their voices coming muffled and strange through the hat boxes they wore on their heads. Chilliwalla, 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 echoed Planety waving cheerfully at the oncoming host. Shh, psst, princess. That may be a war cry, warned Randy, drawing his sword and swinging it so swiftly round his head it whistled. Thun, too astonished to move a step, stood with lowered head, his flaming breath darting harmlessly into the moist floor of the forest. Chilliwalla, 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 roared the boxers, keeping a safe distance from Kabumpo's lashing trunk. Chilliwalla, Chilliwalla! Their voices rose loud and imploring, as Randy slid off the elegant elephant's back to place himself beside Planety. A perfectly enormous boxer came clumping out of the box wood to the left. Yes, yes, he grunted, holding on his hat box as he ran. When he caught sight of the travelers, he stopped short, and not satisfied with peering through the eye holes in his hat box took it off altogether and stood staring at them, his square eyes almost popping from his square head. Box their ears, box their ears, box their heads and arms and rears, box their legs, their hands and chests, box that fire plug for all the rest. An iron box, screamed Chilliwalla, as Thun with a soundless snort sent a shower of sparks into a candy box bush, toasting all the marshmallows in the boxes. Oh, aren't you afraid to go about in this barebacked, barefaced, unboxed condition, he panted, exposed to the awful dangers of the raw outer air? Chilliwalla hastily clapped on his hat box, but not before Randy noticed that his ears were nicely boxed too. Without waiting for an answer to his question, the boxer, with one shove of his enormous boxed fist, pushed Thun under a box tree. Planety had just time to leap from his back when Chilliwalla shook a huge iron box loose, and it came clanking down over the thunder colt. It was open at the bottom, and Thun, kicking and rearing underneath, jerked it east and west. "'He'll soon grow used to it,' muttered Chilliwalla, jabbing a dozen holes in the metal with a sharp pick he had drawn from a pocket in his box coat. "'Now then, who's next?' Ah, what a lovely lady! Chilliwalla gazed rapturously at the princess from another planet, and then, clapping his hands, called sharply, Bring the jewel boxes for her ears, flower boxes for herself, a bonnet box for her head, candy boxes for her hands, slipper boxes for those tiny silver feet. Bring stocking boxes, glove boxes, and hurry, hurry! Oh, please, Randy put himself firmly between Planety and the determined Chilliwalla. The outer air does not hurt us at all, Mr. Chilliwalla. In fact, we like it. Just try to find a box big enough for me, invited Kabumpo, 
snatching up the little princess and setting her high on his shoulder. "'I think I have a packing-box that would just fit,' mused the chief boxer, holding his arms and looking sideways at the elegant elephant. "'Pack him up! Pack him off! Send him packing!' chattered the other boxers, who had never seen anything like Kabumpo in their lives, and distrusted him highly. But Chillywalla himself was quite interested in his singular visitors, and inclined to be more than friendly. "'Better try our boxes,' he urged seriously, as he took the pile of bright cardboard containers an assistant had brought him. "'Without bragging, I can say that they are the best boxes grown, stylish, nicely fitting, and decidedly comfortable to wear.' "'Ha, ha!' rumbled Kabumpo, rocking backward and forward at the very idea. "'Mean to tell me you wear boxes over your other clothes and everywhere you go?' "'Certainly,' Chillywalla nodded vigorously. "'Do you suppose we want to stand around and disintegrate? "'What happens to articles after they are taken out of their boxes?' he demanded, argumentatively. "'Tell me that.' "'Why,' said Randy thoughtfully, "'they're worn or sold.' or eaten or spoiled exactly chillywalla snapped him up quickly they are worn out they lose their freshness and their newness well we intend to save ourselves from such a fate and we do he added complacently you're certainly fresh enough chuckled kabumpo with a wink at randy but might not these boxes be fun to wear inquired planetty looking rather wistfully at the bright heap the boxer chief had intended for her. "'No, no, and no,' rumbled Kabumpo positively. "'No boxes.' "'As you wish.' Chillywalla shrugged his shoulders under his cardboard clothes box. "'Shall I unbox the horse?' "'Better not,' decided Randy, looking anxiously at the sparks issuing from the punctures in Thun's box. "'But perhaps you would show us the way through this... this... Boxwood finished Chillywalla. Yes, I will be most honored to conduct you through our forest, and you may pick as many boxes as you wish, too, he added generously. I'd like to do something for people who are so soon to spoil and wither. Ha ha! Now I'm sure that's very kind of you, roared Kabumpo, wiping his eyes on the fringe of his robe, and I think it best we hurry along, my good fellow. Ho! Wither away! It would never do to have a spoiled king and princess and a bad horse and elephant on your hands. Oh, if you'd only wear our boxes, begged Chillywalla, almost ready to cry at the prospect of his visitors spoiling on the premises. Then, as Kabumpo shook his head again, the big boxer started off at a rapid shuffle, anxious to have them out of the woods as soon as possible. Thun, during all this conversation, had been kicking and bucking under his iron box, but now Planety tapped out a reassuring message with her staff, and the thunder colt quieted down. On the whole, he behaved rather well, following the signals his little mistress tapped out, and pushing the iron box along without too much discomfort or complaint, though occasional indignant and fiery protests came puffing out of his iron container. Randy considered the journey through the boxwood one of their gayest and most entertaining adventures. The woodmen, in their brightly decorated boxes, shuffled cheerfully along beside them, stopping now and then to point with pride to their square box-like dwellings, set at regular intervals under the spreading boxwood trees. The whole forest was covered by an enormous wooden box that shut out the sky and gave everything an artificial and unreal look. It was in one side of this monster box that Thun had burned the hole to admit them. Randy and Planety, riding sociably together on Kabumpo's back, picked boxes from branches of all the trees they could reach, and it was such fun and so exciting they paid scarcely any attention to the remarks of Chillywalla. Even the elegant elephant snapped off a box or two and handed them back to his loyal riders. "'Oh, look!' exulted Randy, opening a bright blue cardboard box. "'This is just full of chocolate candy.' "'Oh, throw that trash away,' advised Chillywalla contemptuously. "'We think nothing of the stuff that grows inside. "'It's the boxes themselves we are after.' "'But this candy is good,' objected Randy, 
after sampling several pieces. And mind you, Kabumpo, Planity has just picked a jewel box full of real chains, rings, and bracelets. Oh, they are netiful, netiful, crooned the princess of another planet, hugging the velvet jewel box to her breast. Keep them if you wish, sniffed Chillywalla, but they're just rubbish to us. When we pick boxes, we toss the contents away. Now that's plain foolishness, snorted Kabumpo, aghast at such a waste, as Randy picked a pencil box full of neatly sharpened pencils, and Planity a tidy sewing kit fitted out with scissors, needles, and spools of thread. The thimble was not quite ripe, but as Planity had never stitched a stitch in her royal life, she did not notice nor care about that. Indeed, before they came to the other side of the box wood, she and Randy were sitting in the midst of a high heap of their treasures, and Kabumpo looked as if he were making a lengthy safari, loaded up and down for the journey. Randy had stuffed most of the boxes into big net bags Kabumpo always brought along for emergencies, and these he tied to the elegant elephant's harness. There were bread boxes packed with tiny loaves and biscuits, cake boxes stuffed with sugar buns and cookies, stamp boxes, flower boxes, glove boxes, coat and suit boxes. Last of all, Randy picked a band box, and it played such gay tunes when he lifted the lid, Planity clapped her silver hands, and even Kabumpo began to hum under his breath. Traveling through the box wood with kind-hearted Chillywalla was more like a surprise party than anything else. To Planity it was all so delightful, she began to wonder how she had ever been satisfied with her life on another planet. "'Are all the countries down here as different and happy as this?' she asked, fingering the necklace she had taken from the jewel box. "'All our countries are grayling and sad. No birds sing, no flowers grow, and people are all the same.' "'Oh, just wait till you've been to Oz!' exclaimed Randy shutting the bandbox so he could talk better. Oz countries are even more surprising than this, and wait till you've seen Ev and Jinnicky's red glass castle. You'll never reach it, predicted Chillywalla, shaking his hat box gloomily. You'll spoil in a few hours now, especially the big one, loaded down with all that stuff and rubbish. Throw it away, he begged again, looking so sorrowful. Randy was afraid he was going to burst out crying. "'Toss out that rubbish and wear our boxes before it is too late.' "'Rubbish!' Randy shook his finger reprovingly at the boxer. "'Why, all these things are terribly nice and useful. "'If we go through enemy countries, we can placate the natives with cakes and cigars. "'And if we go through friendly countries, we use the suits and flowers and candy for gifts. "'Really, you've been a great help to us, Mr. Chillywalla. "'And if you ever come to regalia, you may have anything in my castle you wish. Are there any boxes in your castle? Chillywalla peered up at Randy through the slits in his hat box. Not many, admitted Randy truthfully. You see, in my country we keep the contents and throw the boxes away. Throw the boxes away, gasped Chillywalla, jumping three times into the air. Oh, you rogue, you rascals, you boxables! "'Lefters, writers, boxers, all! "'Here, here at once! "'Have at these box-destroying savages!' "'Now see what you've done,' mourned Kabumpo, "'as hundreds of the boxers, heeding Chillywalla's call, "'darted out of their dwellings and came leaping "'from behind the box-bushes and trees. "'You've started a war, that's what!' "'Box them! Box them good!' shrieked Chillywalla, "'raining harmless blows on Kabumpo's trunk with his boxed fists. A hundred more boxed both Thun and the elegant elephant from the rear, and so loud and angry were their cries, Planity covered her ears. Too bad we have to leave when everything was so pleasant, wheezed Kabumpo, but never mind. Here's the other side of the box wood. Flatten out, youngsters, and I'll bump through. And bump through he did, with such a splintering of boards, it sounded like an explosion of cannon crackers. Thon, at three taps from Planity, bumped after him, and before the boxers realized what was happening, they were far away from there. 
"'I'll soon have that box off you,' panted Kabumpo, and putting his trunk under Thun's iron box, he heaved it up in short order, screaming shrilly as he did, for the Thunder Colt's breath had made the metal uncomfortably hot. "'I thank you, great and mighty master,' Thun sent the words up in a perfect shower of sparks. "'Let us be gone from these noxious boxers.' "'Oh, they're not so bad,' mused Randy, as Planety signaled for Thun to go left. "'Just peculiar. Imagine keeping the boxes and throwing away all the lovely things inside. And imagine a country where everything grows in boxes,' he added, standing up to wave at Chillywalla and his square-headed comrades, who were looking angrily through the break in the side of their wall. "'Good-bye,' he called clearly. "'Good-bye, Chillywalla, and thanks for the presents.' "'Boxables!' hissed the boxer chief and his men, shaking their fists furiously at the departing visitors. "'And that makes us no better than cannibals, I suppose,' grunted Kabumpo, looking rather wearily at the stretch of forest ahead. He had rather hoped to find himself in open country. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of the Silver Princess in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. The Silver Princess in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter Ten Night in the Forest. All afternoon the four travelers moved through the Ixian Forest. Planety exclaiming over the flowers, ferns, and bright birds that flitted from tree to tree, Thun sending up frequent high-flown sentences, Kabumpo and Randy looking rather anxiously for some landmark that would prove they were on the road to Ev. As it grew darker, the elegant elephant wisely decided to make camp, stopping in a small tidy clearing for that purpose. As Kabumpo swung to an impressive halt, Randy slid to the ground, pulling the net bags with him, and began to sort out the boxes containing food. Then he quickly gathered some faggots for a fire, as the night was raw and chilly, and had Planety signal Thun to breathe on the wood. Thun, only too happy to be of some use, quickly lighted the campfire, and he and the little princess watched curiously while Randy prepared his own and Kabumpo's supper making coffee in a tin box with some water Kabumpo had fetched in his collapsible canvas bucket. The elegant elephant did rather well with the contents of seven cake boxes and four bread and cereal containers, and Randy found so many good things to eat among Chillywalla's presents, he felt sorry not to be able to share them with Planety or Thun. "'It would be more fun if you ate too,' he observed, looking down sideways at the little princess." who was sitting on a boulder, hands clasped about her knees, while she gazed contentedly up at the stars. "'Would it?' Planety smiled faintly, tapping her silver heels against the rock. "'This seems night enough,' she sighed, stretching up her arms luxuriantly. "'But now it is time to ret. Slipping off her long metal cape, the princess of another planet tossed one end against a white birch, and the other to a tall pine. To Randy's surprise, the ends of the cape instantly attached themselves to the trees, making a soft, flexible hammock. Into this, Planety climbed with utmost ease and satisfaction. "'Good net, Randy and Big Bumpo, dear,' she called softly. "'Take care of Thun. I've told him to stay where he is till the earling, and he will, he will.' With a smile, Planety closed her bright eyes, and the wind swaying her silver hammock soon rocked her to sleep. It had been a long day, and Randy felt very drowsy himself. Walking over to the thunder colt, he turned his head so that his fiery breath would fall harmlessly on a cluster of damp rocks. He was pleased to find this steed from another planet so obedient and gentle. Though formed of some live and lively black metal, Thun was soft and satiny to the touch, and seemed to enjoy having his ears scratched and his neck rubbed as much as an ordinary horse. "'Tap me twice on the shoulder if aught occurs, Slandy,' he signaled, 
blowing the words out lazily between Randy's pats, and good net to you, my nazis, good net. That language is just full of foolishness, sniffed Kabumpo, spreading a blanket on the ground for Randy, and then stretching himself full length beneath a beech tree. Put out the fire, Nazi, my lad. The creature's breath makes light enough to frighten off any wild men or monsters. Oh, I don't believe there are any wild beasts or savages in this forest, Randy said, stamping out the embers of the campfire. It's too quiet and peaceful. I have an idea we're almost across Ix and we'll reach Ev by morning. What do you think, Kabumpo? Kabumpo made no answer, for the elegant elephant had stopped thinking and was already comfortably a snore. So, with a terrific yawn, Randy wrapped himself in the blanket, and curling up close to his big and faithful comrade, fell into an instant and pleasant slumber. Morning came all too soon, and Randy was rudely awakened by Kabumpo, who was shaking him violently by the shoulders. "'Come on, come on!' blustered the elegant elephant impatiently. "'Stir out of it, my boy. We've all been up for hours. Is it proper to lie abed and let a princess light the fire?' She didn't. Sitting bolt upright, Randy saw that Planity, with Thun's help, actually had lighted a fire and set water to boil in the tin box, just as he had done the evening before. "'Oh, my goodness, goodness, Planity! You mustn't do that rough work, he exclaimed, hurrying over to take the big cake box from Planety's hands. Why not, beamed the little princess, hugging the box close. See, I have found the great chock nut cake for Big Bumpo to eat. I mean neat. Ha, ha, chock nut cake, Kabumpo swayed merrily from side to side. Very neat, my dear. If there's one thing I love for breakfast, it's chock nut cake. Laughing so he could hardly keep his balance, Kabumpo held out his trunk for the cake box. What a splendid little castle keeper you'll make for some young king, Netty, my child. Netty, is that now my name? Planety pushed back her flying cloud of hair with an interested sniff. If you like it, said Randy, his ears turning quite red at Kabumpo's teasing remarks. Leading the little princess to a flat rock, he sat her down with great ceremony, and then began opening up boxes of crackers and fruit. Nettie's a night name, decided the princess, her head thoughtfully on one side. I must tell Thun. Skipping over to the thunder colt, who, with drooping head and tail, was enjoying a little colt nap, she tapped out her new nickname in the strange code she used when talking to him. No longer planity of another planet, flashed Thun, awake in a twinkling and sending up his message in a shower of sparks, but anity of Oz. At least he's left off the N, mumbled Kabumpo, speaking thickly through the coca-nut cake which he had tossed whole into his capacious mouth. Sounds rather well, don't you think? Wonderful, agreed Randy, who could scarcely keep his eyes off the sparkling little princess. It's too bad she's not like us, Kabumpo. Then she could go back to Oz and stay there always. If she were like us, she wouldn't be so interesting, said Kabumpo, shaking his head judiciously. Besides, down here the poor child is completely out of her element and liable to disintegrate or suffocate or Ev knows what, he went on, discarding a box of prunes for a carton of tea. How was the cake? Randy changed the subject, for he could not bear to think of planity and danger of any sort. Stale, announced Kabumpo, making a wry face as he swallowed some tea leaves. I'll certainly be glad to catch up with some regular elephant food. This eating bits out of boxes is diabolical, simply diabolical. Here, give me those crackers and eat some of that other stuff. And look at little Nettie Ann, would you? shaking out that blanket as if she'd been traveling with us for years. Why, the lass is a born housewife. And isn't she pretty, smiled Randy, waving to Planety as he began packing the boxes in the net bags again and stamping out the fire. I wonder what it's like up where she lives, Kabumpo. Why not ask her? 
Swinging up his saddle sacks, Kabumpo called gaily to the little princess, who came running over, the blanket neatly folded on her arm. "'Thank you, Nettie. You are certainly a great help to us.' Taking the blanket and giving her an approving pat on the shoulder, Randy caught hold of Kabumpo's belt strap and pulled himself easily aloft. All ready to go? Planetty nodded cheerfully as she mounted the Thunder Colt. Will this lightling be as night as the last, she demanded, tapping Thun gently with her staff. Nicer, promised Randy, as Thun pranced merrily ahead, Planetty's long cape billowing like a silver cloud behind them. What do you do when you are at home? called Randy, as Kabumpo, giving two short trumpets, followed close on the heels of the Thunder Colt. Home? Planetty turned a frankly puzzled face. I mean, do you have a house or a castle? persisted Randy, determined to have the matter settled in his mind once for all. Do you have brothers and sisters, and is your father a king? No house, no castle, no those other words, answered Planetty, an even greater bewilderment. On another planet, each is to herself or himself alone. One floats, rides, skips, or drifts through the leadling heights and lowlands, hanging the cape where one happens to be. Regular gypsies, murmured Kabumpo under his breath. So nobody belongs to nobody, and nobody ha has anybody? Sounds kind of crazy to me. Yes, if you have no families, no fathers or mothers. Randy was plainly distressed by such a country and existence. I don't see how you came to be at all. We rise full grown from Marvanadium Springs, and naturally I have my own spring. Is that then my father? Tell her yes, hissed Kabumpo between his tusks. Why mix her all up with our way of doing things? If she wants a spring for a father, let her have it. Kabumpo waved his trunk largely. Ho, ho, crump! I've always thought of springs as a cure for rheumatism. But live and learn, eh, Randy? Live and learn. Randy paid small attention to the elegant elephant's asides. He was too busy explaining life as it was lived in Oz to Planety making it all so bright and fascinating, the eyes of the little princess fairly sparkled with interest and envy. "'I think I will not go with you to this wizard of Ev,' she announced, in a small voice as the young king paused for breath. "'I do not believe I shall like that old wizard or his castle.' Touching Thun with her staff, Planety turned the thunder colt sideways and went zigzagging so rapidly through the trees they almost lost sight of her entirely. Now what? stormed the elegant elephant, charging recklessly after her through the forest. What's come over the little netwit? Come back, come back, you foolish girl, he trumpeted anxiously. We'll take you to Oz after you've been to Ev, he added, with a sudden burst of comprehension. At Kabumpo's promise, Planety half turned on her charger. But this wizard of Ev will send us back to another planet. It is yourself that has said so. No, no, we just said he would help you, shouted Randy, leaning forward and waving both arms for Planety to turn back. Oh, you really must see Jinnicky, he begged earnestly. Without his magic, you cannot live away from that vanadium spring. Do you want to be stiff and still as a statue for the rest of your days? I'd rather be a statue down here with you and Bumpo, where the birds sing and the flowers grow, and the woods are green and wonderful, than to be a live princess of another planet, sighed the metal maiden, hiding her face in Thun's mane. You would, cried Randy, almost falling off the elephant in his extreme joy and excitement. Then you just shall, and Jinnicky will change everything so that you can live down here always and come back to Oz with Kabumpo and me. Would you like that, Planety? Oh, that would be netiful! Clasping Thun with both arms, the little princess laid her soft cheek against his neck. Netiful! Then ride on, princess, ride on, Kabumpo spoke gruffly, for his feelings had quite overcome him. Toss me a kerchief, will you, Randy? He gulped desperately. Oh, boo-hoo, cursniff! <laughs> to think she really likes us that much. 
Do you think she'd hear if I blew my trunk? No, no, she's way ahead of us now, whispered Randy, handing an enormous handkerchief down to Kabumpo after taking a sly wipe on it himself. Oh, isn't this a gorgeous day, Kabumpo? And isn't everything turning out splendidly? And see there, we've actually come to the end of the forest. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of the Silver Princess in Oz」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Silver Princess in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson The Field of Feathers Good capers, everything's pink, marveled Randy as Kabumpo, still muttering and snuffling, pushed his way through the last fringe of the forest. So now we're in the pink, eh? With a last convulsive snort, Kabumpo stuffed the handkerchief into a lower pocket and trumpeted three times for a thun to hold. Are those flowers, do you suppose? May I see one of them, my dear? Catching up with a little princess who was already on the edge of the field, Kabumpo took the long spray she had picked and passed it back to Randy. My goodness, it's a feather! The largest and finest I've ever seen, Randy said in surprise. Hey, I always thought feathers grew on birds, yet here's a whole field of feathers, Kabumpo. Imagine that! And taller than I am, too. Well, there's no harm in feathers, observed Kabumpo jocularly. Pick a plume for your bonnet, my child. The girls in our countries adorn themselves with these pretty fripperies. I've even worn them myself at court functions, he admitted self-consciously. But do you think you can hold a colt's head up as we go through? Burnt feathers smell rather awful, and we don't wish to anger the owner or spoil his crop. A bit confused by the word owner and crop, Planety nevertheless caught the idea and explained it so cleverly to Thun, the thundercold started through the field, holding his head high and handsome so that the flames spurted upward and not down. It was rather like ploughing through a wheat field, decided Randy as Kabumpo, treading lightly as he could, stepped after Thun. It was, though, more like a sea of waving plumes, endlessly bending, nodding and rippling in the wind. Planety gathered armfuls of these bright, newest treasures, liking them almost as much as the flowers in the forest. Thun, for his part, found the whole experience irksome in the extreme. These pink feathers give me the big pain in the neck, he puffed up indignantly as he trotted along with his head in the air. Planety, reading his message with a little smile, was astonished to hear a series of roars and explosions behind her. Surely Thun's remarks weren't as funny as all that. Turning round, she was shocked to see Kabumpo swaying and stumbling in his tracks, coughing and spluttering, and torn by such gigantic guffaws he had already shaken Randy from his back. The young king himself rolled and twisted on the ground, fairly gasping for breath. It's the feathers, he gasped weakly, as Planety, leaving off the thundercold, ran back to investigate. They're tickling us to death. Get away quickly, Nettie, dear, before they get you. Oh, <laughs> oh, quick, before it's too late. <laughs> I shall die laughing. To the start of the little princess, he appeared to be dying already. No, please not, she cried, dropping her armful of feathers. With surprising strength, she jerked Randy upright, and in spite of his continued roars and wild writhing, managed to fling him across Thun's back. Now Kabumpo was down, kicking and rolling hysterically. It seemed to Planety that the feathers were wickedly alive and tickling them on purpose. They tossed, swayed and brushed against her and Thun too, but having no effect on the metallic skin of the nothers, curled away in distaste. Stop! Stop! I hate you! screamed Planety, stamping on the bunch she had picked a moment before, then struggling in vain to pull Kabumpo up by his trunk. Thun! Thun! What shall we do? Racing back to the thundercold, Planety tapped out all that was happening to their best and only friends, holding the convulsed and still laughing Randy in place with one hand as she did so. Thun, from anxious glances over his shoulder, had guessed more than half the difficulty. Search in the Kabumpti's pocket for something to tie around him so I may pull him out of the feathers, flashed the thundercold, swinging in a circle to prance and stamp on the plume still curling down to tickle the helpless boy on his back. Feeling in Kabumpo's pockets as he tossed and lashed about was hard enough, but Planety, who was quick and clever, 
soon found the long, stout, heavily linked gold chain Kabumpo twisted round and round his neck on important occasions. Slipping the chain through his belt, the little princess clasped the other ends round the thundercold's chest, making a strong and splendid harness. Then, mounting quickly and holding desperately to Randy, Planety gave the signal for Thun to start, and away through the deadly field charged the night-black steed, burning feathers left and right with his flashing breath and dragging Kabumpo along as easily as if he had been a sack of potatoes instead of a two-ton elephant. The feathers bending beneath made the going soft so that the elegant elephant did not suffer so much as a scratch, and Thun galloped so swiftly that in less than ten minutes they had reached the other side of the beautiful but treacherous field. Going half a mile beyond, Thun came to an anxious halt, the golden chain falling slack around his ankles, while Planety jumped down to see how Kabumpo was doing now. The elegant elephant had stopped laughing, but his eyes still rolled and his muscles still twitched and rippled from the terrible tickling he had endured. Randy, exhausted and weak, hung like a dummy stuffed with straw over the thundercold's back. "'Oh, we were too late, too long,' mourned Planety, wringing her hands and running distractedly between the elegant elephant and the insensible king. "'Oh, my netness, they will become stiff and still as mothers deprived of their springs,' she tapped out dolefully to Thun. "'Do not be too sure,' the thunder cold puffed out his message slowly. "'See, already the big Kabumti is trying to rise.' "'And such indeed was the case.' Astonished and mortified to find himself stretched on the ground in broad daylight and still too confused to realize what had happened, the elegant elephant lurched to his feet and stood blinking uncertainly around. Then, his eyes suddenly coming into proper focus, he caught sight of Randy lying limply across the thundercold. "'What in us? What in Ix? What in Eve is the matter here?' he panted, wobbling dizzily over to Thun. "'Feathers!' sighed Planety, clasping both arms round Kabumpo's trunk and beginning to pat and smooth its wrinkled surface. The feathers tickled you and you fell down, my poor Bumpo. Randy, too, was almost laughed to death. What does death mean? Planety looked up anxiously into his eyes. Great grump! So that was it! Great gillikins! I remember now. We were both nearly tickled to death and it was awful, awful! Not that oceans ever do die, he explained hastily. But after all, we are not in Oz, and anything might have happened. And what I'd like to know is how and if we ever got out of those feathers. Thun pulled you out, Planety told him proudly. And look, look, Bumpo dear, Randy's going to waken too. Randy, Randy, do you hear that? Kabumpo lifted the young king down and shook him gently backward and forward. This cult of Planety's, this thunder cult, all by himself, mind you, pulled us out of that infernal feather field. You and me, but mostly me. Now tell me, how did he manage to pull an elephant all that way? Randy, only half comprehending what Kabumpo was saying, said nothing. But Thun, guessing Kabumpo's question, threw back his head and puffed quickly. We nothers are strong as iron, master. Strong for ourselves, strong for our friends. Thun, the thunder cold, will always be strong for Kabumti. Strong? Strong? Why, you're marvelous, gasped the elegant elephant. Placing Randy on the ground, he fished jewels from his pocket with a reckless trunk till he found the band of pearls to fit Thun. Then, carelessly risking the sparks from the thundercold's nostrils, he fastened the pearls in place. "'Tell him, tell him thanks,' he blurted out breathlessly. "'Tell him from now on we are friends and equals, friends and warriors together.' With a pleased nod, Planety translated for Thun, and the delighted cold, tossing his flying mane, raced round and round his three comrades, filling the air with high-flown and flaming sentences. "'Friends and warriors!' he heralded, rearing joyously. "'Friends and warriors!' By this time, Randy had recovered his breath and his memory, and felt not only able but impatient to continue the journey. The field of feathers could still be seen waving pink and provokingly in the distance, but without one backward glance the four travellers set their faces to the north. A few of Chiliwala's boxes had been crushed while Kabumpa rolled in the feathers, and he and Randy still felt weak and worn from their dreadful experience. But these were small matters when they considered the dreadful fate they had escaped through the quick action of Planety and Thun. "'I always thought of Ix as a pleasant country,' sighed Randy as Kabumpo moved slowly along a shady bypath. 
I don't believe this is X, stated the elegant elephant bluntly. The air is different, smells salty, and this sandy road looks as if we might be near the sea. I think myself that we've come north by east through X into Eve, and we'll reach the nonestic ocean by evening. Kabumpo paused to peer up at a rough board nailed to a pine. So, you got through the feathers, did you? sneered the notice in threatening red letters. Then so much the worse for you. Beware, watch out. Glutwig the Glubrious has his eye on you. Glubrious, sniffed Kabumpo, elevating his trunk scornfully as Randy read and reread the impertinent message. I don't recall anyone named Glutwig, do you? Sounds rather awful, doesn't it? whispered Randy, sliding to the ground to examine the billboard from all sides. Say, look here, Kabumpo, there's something on the back. It's been scratched out with red chalk, but I can still read it. Then read it, advised Kabumpo briefly. This is the land of Eve. Everybody welcome. Take this road to the castle of the Red Jinn. Oh, that means we're almost there, exulted the young king, but his joy evaporated quickly as he reread the other side of the board. Looks as if someone has switched signs on Jinniki, he muttered, pushing back his crown with a little whistle. Do you think anything has happened to him? Probably some mischievous country boy trying out his chalk, answered the elegant elephant, not believing one of his own words. Straight on, my dear, he called cheerfully to Planety, who had pulled in the colt and was looking questioningly back at them. At last we are in the land of Eve, and just ahead lies the castle of our wizard. Oh, Bumpo, how night! Planety hugged herself in pure joy. I've never seen a castle. I've never seen a wizard. But Kabumpo worried Randy as the little princess of another planet galloped gaily ahead of him. Suppose this Gludwig really has his eye on us. Suppose he rushes out before we can reach Jinniki's castle. Well, that will not be very nice, will it? The elegant elephant spoke ruefully. But what can we do? Are we going to stop for a mere sign? No, declared Randy, feeling about for his sword. Of course not. But I'll wager a willikin he was the fellow who planted those feathers. Very likely, agreed Kabumpo, pushing grimly along through the sand. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of The Silver Princess in Oz This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Silver Princess in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson Arrival at the Castle of the Red Jinn The further they travelled into F, the more interesting the country became to Planety and Thun. Now wild orange and lemon trees added their spicy tang to the salty air. Waving palms edged the sandy roadway, and after traversing a grove of lordly coconut trees, the four suddenly found themselves facing the great, green, rolling Nonestic. A spring! caroled Planety, galloping Thun down to the water's edge. Oh, never have I seen so netiful a spring. Not a spring, princess. An ocean, corrected Kabumpo, ambling good-naturedly after Thun. This is a salt sea, full of ships, sailors, shells, crabs, islands, fish and fishermen. And will I see all of them? Slipping from Thun's back, Planety waded out a little way hopping gleefully over the edges of the smaller waves. Sometime, promised Randy, dismounting hastily to keep her from venturing too far. Look over your shoulder, Nettie, he urged, drawing her back towards shore. And then tell me what you think. Explaining this gay, wide and wonderful world to the little princess of another planet, Randy found more fun than anything he had ever done or imagined. Tense with expectation, he and Kabumpo watched as Planety gazed off to the right. Why, tis a high, high hill of red that glitters! Or what? What is it? Planety whirled Thun round so he could see too. It's a castle, my lass. Kabumpo swaggered down the beach, as if he alone were responsible for all its splendor and magnificence. There you see the imperial palace of the Wizard of Ev built from turret to cellar of finest red glass studded with rubies, and there, this night, we will be suitably entertained by Jinniki himself. The inside's even better than the outside, Randy whispered in Planet's ear as she tapped out this astonishing news to the thunder cold. Come on, come on. It's not more than a mile, and we can go straight along the edge of the seashore. 
Say, weren't we lucky not to run into Gludwig? Pulling himself up on Kabumpo's back, Randy spoke the words softly. It would have been too bad to have the first person outside of ourselves that Planety met turn out a villain. I believe that sign was a joke. Well, everything seems all right so far, admitted the elegant elephant guardedly. But keep your eyes open, my boy. Keep your eyes open. Is that a welcome committee marching along the beach, or is it an army? They're still too far to tell, answered Randy. Looks to me like old Jinnicky's blacks. I can see their baggy red trousers and turbans. Yes, but what is that gleaming in the sunlight? demanded Kabumpo, curling up his trunk uneasily. Only their scimitars, Randy said, standing up to have a better view. Each man is carrying a scimitar over his shoulder, but that's perfectly all right. They're probably parading for our benefit. Hmm, sometimes things are not what they scimitar, sniffed Kabumpo, snapping his eyes suspiciously. But Randy, paying no attention to the elegant elephant's remark, was feeling round in the net bags for Chilliwala's bandbox, and next moment the lively strains of a military march filled the air. Swinging along in time to the music, Kabumpo peered sharply at the oncoming host for signs of Ali Babel, or Ginger, the slave of the bell, or some of Jinniki's other old and trusted counsellors. But in all that great throng there was no one familiar face, and because he was beginning to feel more than a bit worried, Kabumpo lifted his feet higher and higher. Everything looks black, very black, he muttered dubiously. Why not? cried Randy, waving his arms like a bandmaster. They're all as black as the ace of spades. Mind you, Planety, it takes all these black men to take care of the Jinniki and his castle. And will they take care of us? Planety eyed the marchers with positive amazement and alarm. So many, she murmured in a hushed voice. So black. I thought everyone down here would be like you and Bumpo. My, no, Randy told her complacently. Everyone is liable to be different. I believe I'll toss out some of Chilliwala's boxes. Visitors should come bearing presents, you know. Hastily, Randy began pulling out boxes of candy, boxes of cigarettes, beads, cigars, and whole suits of clothing to dazzle Jinnicky's subjects. But when the leader of the procession came within ten feet of the travellers, he threw back his head and emitted such a blood-curling howl. Randy's hair rose on his head, and as the rest of the blacks, brandishing scimitars and yelling threats and imprecations, came leaping toward them, the desperate young king began hurling down boxes as if they were bombs. He caught the headman on the chin with the bandbox, but while it stopped the music, it did not stop the gigantic avian from slashing at Thun. As his scimitar fell, Kabumpo gave a trumpet that felled the whole front rank of the enemy. Snatching up the villain in his trunk, he hurled him back among his men. Is this... is this taking care of us? shuddered Planety, clasping her arms round the neck of the plunging thundercold. No, no, my goodness, no! Is Thun hurt? Quick, Kabumpo! screamed Randy as second scimitar slashed down on Thun's flank. Then he managed to breathe again, for the razor-sharp weapon glanced harmlessly off the metal coat of Planety's coal-black charger. The wielder of the scimitar, however, did not escape so easily, for a hot blast from Thun's nostrils sent him reeling backward. That's it! Give it to them! Give it to them! shouted Randy, forgetting in his excitement that Thun could not hear, and he himself hurled Chilliwala's boxes hard and viciously one after the other. As for Kabumpo, every time he raised his trunk, there was a black man in it, and as fast as they came he slung them over his shoulder. But it was Planety who really turned the tide of the battle. While Randy, who had exhausted his supply of boxes, was digging desperately in Kabumpo's pockets for some more missiles, he heard a perfect chorus of terrified screeches. Popping up with an umbrella and an alarm clock, he saw the princess of another planet standing erect on the galloping colt's back, calmly and precisely casting her staff at the foe. Each time the staff struck, the victim, in whatever attitude he happened to be, was frozen into a motionless metal figure. After each stroke, the staff returned to Planety's hand. Ya, yeah, ya, yeah, ma master well, the frantic blacks who were still able to move, and tumbling over one another in their effort to escape, they fled wildly back to the red castle, leaving behind sixty of their vanquished brethren. You, you, you'll be sorry for this, shouted the headman, tearing off his turban and waving it as he ran. So will you, bellowed Kabumpo fiercely. 
just wait till Jinnicky hears about this. How dare you treat his visitors in this violent, wicked fashion? Jinnicky, Jinnicky, jeered the headman as Planety aimed her staff threateningly at his back. Jinnicky is at the bottom of the sea. Hmm, hmm, I knew it, I knew it, groaned the elegant elephant as the headman reached the palace and sitted wildly up the glass steps. I knew something was wrong the moment I saw those scimitars. Jinnicky gone? Jinnicky at the bottom of the sea? Why, I just can't believe it. Randy, glancing over his shoulder at the tumbling monastic, looked almost ready to cry. Then putting back his shoulders, he declared fiercely, Well, I'm not going off and leave this old pirate in Jinnicky's castle, are you? It must be Gludwig's doing. All this. Let's go inside and throw him out of there. We have lots of help now. Thun's a regular flamethrower, and Planety's worth a whole army, and best of all, nothing can hurt them. Why didn't you tell me you had a magic staff? Randy looked admiringly down at the resolute little princess at his side. Why, with that staff we can conquer anybody. Is that what you call magic? Planety regarded her staff with new interest. It certainly is, panted Kabumpo, finding himself with a handy palm leaf. And we're mighty sorry to have gotten you into all this danger and trouble, my dear. Looks as if we had a war on our hands instead of a pleasant vacation. Oh, that. It's nothing, nothing. Planety shrugged her shoulders eloquently. On our planet, we too have the bad beasts and others. And when they try to hit or bite us, we just subdue them with our voral staffs. Hmm, so I see. Kabumpo, still fanning himself, looked thoughtfully at Glutwig's petrified warriors. There must be a goodly bit of statuary on your planet, my lass. Very many, answered Planety soberly, polishing her staff on the end of her cape. With a slight shudder, the elegant elephant turned from the fallen slaves, resolving then and there never to offend this pretty but powerful little metal maiden. Well, have the scoundrels dispersed and gone for good? inquired Thun, sending up his question in a cloud of black smoke. Restively pawing the ground, the thunder colt looked from one to the other, waiting for someone to enlighten him. Tell him they're gone, but for nobody's good, wheezed Kabumpo, who was still out of breath from the violence of the combat. Tell him Glotwick the Glubrious has destroyed the Wizard of F, and that we are now going into the castle to continue the battle. But where shall we start? sighed Randy staring despondently up at the gay red palace where he and Kabumpo had been so royally entertained on their last visit. "'We'll start at the bottom of these steps,' announced Kabumpo grimly, "'and mount on up to the top. "'Then we'll burst into the presence of this wretched wart "'and fling him out the window.' "'But that won't help Jinnicky if he's at the bottom of the sea,' warned Randy, trying to smile at Planety, who was busily tapping off instructions to Thun. "'Ha!' But don't forget, Jinnicky's a wizard, sniffed Kabumpo, pulling in his belt a few inches. And nobody can keep a good wizard down. Besides, Kabumpo dragged his robe a bit to the left and straightened his headpiece. Once inside that castle, we can use some of the Red Jinn's own magic to help him. Magic? Why, of course, I'd forgotten about that. Randy's face cleared and brightened, and seeing Planety and Thun so eager and unafraid beside him, he girded on his sword and, standing upright on Kabumpo's back, gave the signal to start. As they trod up the hundred red glass steps, they could hear windows and doors slamming, the patter of running feet and the tinkle of the hundred glass chimes in the tower. But step by step, and without a pause, Thun and Kabumpo mounted to the top. Beware, beware, Glutwig the Glorious! Here march Kabumpti and Thun, Slandy and Planety, princes of another planet, Friends, equals, and warriors. The thunder call's flaming message, floating like a basal emblem in the air, alarmed the wicked occupant of Jinnicky's castle even more than the invaders themselves. But still confident of his power to vanquish all comers, he waited in evil anticipation for the moment when they would force their way into his presence. Did they imagine because they had frightened a company of foolish slaves they could frighten him? Ha <laughs> ha! Crouched on the red jinn's throne and laughing mirthlessly, Glutwig rubbed his long hands up and down his skinny legs. End of chapter 12 
Chapter Thirteen of the Silver Princess in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Silver Princess in Oz by Ruth Plumly Thompson. Glodwig the Glorious. Psst! Wait! Hold on a minute. As they reached the huge double doors of the castle, Randy tugged violently at Kabumpo's left ear. For the elegant elephant, all humped together, was preparing to bump through. Let Thun break down the door, directed the young king firmly. Thun is of metal, and the glass will not cut him. Then as soon as there is an opening, we can follow. Will you tell him, Planety? Randy looked fondly down at the earnest little princess. And as soon as we are inside, he went on hurriedly, fling your staff at the first person I point out to you. That I will, promised Planety with a brief nod. And giving Thun his orders, she galloped the thunder colt straight at the glass doors. With a crash like the fall of a hundred trays of dishes, the glass doors shivered to bits. Rushing through the flying splinters, Kabumpo and Thun raced together into the palace. How well Randy remembered this cozy throne room, its transparent red glass pillars and floors, its gay red lacquered furniture, its tinkling curtains of strung rubies and the long line of enormous red vases leading up to the throne. But instead of the jolly little gin, encased in his own shining jar, a long, lank black man in a red wig lounged on the seat of state. He was smoking a tenuous red pipe, and as Kabumpo and Thun came to an abrupt halt before him, he blinked wickedly out from under his bushy red lashes. Besides the red-wigged impostor, Randy noted with some relief there was not another soul in sight. Well, demanded Glodwick insolently, what do you hope to accomplish by this unwarranted intrusion? Taking his pipe out of his mouth, he blew a cloud of villainous black smoke into the faces of his visitors. So thick and sulphurous were the fumes, Randy and Kabumpo were rendered speechless. While they choked and spluttered, Planety, who did not seem aware of the smoke at all, gazed in wide-eyed delight around her. So this was a castle. How night, how nightful! Lost in wonder and admiration, the little princess forgot all about the stern purpose of their visit. Off that throne, off that throne, you ward! rasped Kabumpo, clearing his throat with an ear-splittering trumpet. What have you done with Jinnicky? You're no more a wizard than I am. You're as false and crooked as your wig. Down with him, down with him, Randy. Let him repent of his wickedness in uttermost disgrace in the basement. So my downfall is the little plan. Speaking calmly, but trembling with fury at Kabumpo's taunting speech, Glodwig rose. At the same instant, Randy, recovering his breath, called desperately. Now, Planety, your staff! Throw it straight at him! Quickly! Thun's hot breath was already singeing Glodwig's ankles, and leaping over the throne, he crouched down like a great black panther behind it. Ha ha! he shouted again. My downfall and debasement, is it? Well, try a bit of downfalling and debasement yourselves. Just as Planety, taking careful aim, hurled her gleaming staff, Glodwig pulled a tremendous lever in the wall beside him. Instantly, the floor on the other side of the throne dropped down, slanting Kabumpo, Thun, and both riders into the dark, damp, and long unused cellar of the castle. A trap door, reached the elegant elephant, coming down like a carload of bricks. A trap floor, you mean? gasped Randy, picking himself up with a painful grimace, for the jolt had sent him flying off the elephant. Thun had retained his balance, and neither he nor Planety seemed to mind the force of their landing. As they gazed angrily upward, the floor of the throne room swung noiselessly back into place, leaving the four prisoners to contemplate the heavy glass beams and panels of its other side. So that was the downfall, and this is the basement, grunted Kabumpo, sitting down furiously on an overturned wash tub. Great grump, I've never been so humiliated in my life. Don't cry, Planety, he begged roughly. We'll have you out of here in a pig's whistle. It's not that, Bumpo, dear. Planety buried her face in Thun's cloudy mane and sobbed bitterly. It's my staff. It did not return after I flung it at the red-wigged one, and without it I have nothing, nothing. Good gullibus! Randy clapped his hand to his forehead as he realized the awful significance of Planety's disclosure. 
the floor tilted too quickly for it to return, and oh, Kabumpo! He wailed, almost forgetting he was a king and warrior. If Glutwig has that stuff, what can we do? He can come down here and petrify us any time he wants. We'll hide, gulped Kabumpo, bounding off the wash tub. With furious concentration, his small eyes roved round and round their gloomy prison. But you're so big, declared Randy, running over to comfort Planety. I'll hide anyway, said Kabumpo, who had no intention of spending the rest of his life as an iron elephant, nor of adorning the palace of Glutwig the Glubrious as the mere image of himself. End of chapter 13「Chapter fourteen of the Silver Princess in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Silver Princess in Oz by Roth Plumley Thompson. The Slave of the Magic Dinner Bell. How thankful Randy and Kabumpo were now for the Thundercold's fiery breath. Otherwise, they would have been in almost complete darkness, as scarcely any light at all trickled down through the dark red glass of the cellar windows. And there was small danger of his setting Jinniki's castle on fire, for the basement, like the rest of the palace, was constructed of thick plates of solid glass. But here below, the glass was not bright and sparkling as it was above stairs. Cobwebs clung to the glass beams, dust powdered the floors and round the walls in boxes and barrels stood the old or worn-out magic appliances of the Red Gin. There was no furnace in the cellar, for the castle was warmed in winter by a magic process of Jinniki's own invention, and there were no doors, not even a closet or cupboard where any of them could hide. With Thun stepping ahead to act as a torch, the others marched anxiously round the great gloomy vault-like apartment. No place to hide, no provisions, nothing to eat or drink, Nothing, exclaimed the elegant elephant, sinking down on the wash tub. That is, nothing to do but wait for destruction, he concluded bitterly. Well, we're not destroyed yet, declared Randy, sticking out his chin. Everything seems quiet above. Maybe Glodwig is not going to use Planety's staff till morning. With a discouraged sniff, Kabumpo began poking in the boxes behind him. Finding one full of excelsior, he started to stuff the choking material into his mouth with his trunk. Randy was sure the Excelsior would disagree with them, but when Kabumpo was in such a mood, it was quite useless to argue with them. So, beckoning for Thun to light the way, he and Planety set out on a second tour of investigation. Randy paused dubiously before a collection of squat bottles and jugs. He was convinced they contained liquids or vapors powerful enough to help them but the directions on the labels were all in some strange magician's code, and Randy hesitated to open even one of the magic bottles. Experience had taught him that a wizard's wares were dangerous, and he himself had seen the red gin subdue whole armies by releasing incense from a blue jug. So, selecting two pocket-sized jars, to use only in case of everything else failed, Randy moved on to the other side of the cellar. Here, on top of a chest, he discovered a small red handbag. Instead of the usual fastenings, two real hands formed the clasp, and when Randy opened the bag it quickly jerked out of his grasp and began springing all over the cellar on its hands, pouncing gleefully on papers and bottles and stuffing them into its side pockets. It did look so comical, Planety burst into a peal of merriment. Even Randy could not keep back a grin. It was a relief to see the little princess more like herself again, for since the loss of her voral staff she had been unnaturally quiet and sad. "'Wait, I'll catch it for you,' offered Randy, dismissing for a moment all thoughts of the dreadful danger they were in. "'It must be one of Jinniki's inventions. Look, Kabumpo, a bag that really packs itself.' "'Watch out it doesn't pinch you,' warned Kabumpo morosely. He had already begun to regret the excelsior and was rumbling with indigestion. "'I was never one to hold with hand luggage myself.' "'Oh, yes you were,' crowed Randy." falling on the bag as if it had been a football and coming up triumphantly with it clutched to his middle. You use your trunk for a hand, Kabumpo, and doesn't that make it hand luggage? Hey, hey, hooray! Never thought I'd make a joke in this dismal place. It's a pretty dismal joke if you ask me. The elegant elephant heaved himself stiffly off the wash tub. Keep it away from me, he warned crossly, as Randy, paying no attention to the thumps of the handbag, managed to get it shut again. 
As soon as it was closed, the bag subsided and seemed absolutely unalive. Here, puffed Randy, holding it out to Planety. This bag will pack itself, madam, and you can use it every time you go on a journey. Can I? How nice! Planety beamed at her young companion. Well, who's going on a journey? inquired Kabumpo sarcastically, walking up and down to relieve his indigestion. We'll probably spend the rest of our unnatural lives in this abominable basement. Say something, can't you? he shouted, glaring at poor Thun. I can hardly see where I'm going. As fast as Planety translated this rude speech, the Thunder Colt sent up his answer. If I said all the words I am thinking, puffed Thun temperishly, this room will be very red bright, Mr. Kabumti, very red bright indeed. The Thunder Colt's speech and his further remarks made Randy and Planety laugh again. Let's see what else we can find, proposed the young king. In spite of Kabumpo's gloomy predictions, he was feeling more hopeful. Maybe this time we'll turn up something we can really use. Oh, maybe yes, maybe yes, trilled Planety, slipping swiftly as Quicksilver after Randy. Passing by some dusty apparatus and an old spinning wheel, they discovered a huge red drum behind the pile of old trunks. The sticks were stuck through a cord in the side, and it was so heavy that the two between them could hardly carry it. But giggling and puffing, they dragged it into the center of the cellar and dropped it down before Kabumpo. See what we have now. Dusting off his clothes, Randy surveyed it proudly. Huh, a drum. The elegant elephant moved his ears forward and then back. Well, what grumpy use is a drum? Am I in a parade? Do you expect me to beat it? Beat the drum? Planety looked surprised and shocked. Is that what a drum is for, Bumpo dear? Well, yes, in a way. A bit ashamed of himself, Kabumpo drew out one of the sticks. It goes like this, he said, raising the drumstick high in his trunk. Oh no, Kabumpo, no! Don't do that or you have Glutwig down here. It would make too much noise. What if it does? Kabumpo shrugged his great shoulders. We might as well perish now as tomorrow. I'm perishing of hunger anyway. Before Randy could interfere, he brought the drumstick down with a thump that split the taut surface of the drum from edge to edge. The loud rip and bong made the rafters ring, and scarcely had they recovered from that shock before a small black boy in an enormous turban sprang out of the drum itself and began sobbing and spluttering and hugging Kabumpo as if he never would let him go. Good Gillikins! It's Ginger! panted Randy, as Planty caught him anxiously by the sleeve. It's the slave of the magic dinner bell. He can bring us dinners and whatever one wants when Jinnicky rings for him. Hi, who shot you up in that drum, boy? That big old red wig, sniffed Ginger, drying his tears in Kabumpo's robe. Oh, how can I ever thank you, Mr. Elephant, so elegant? I remember you. I remember him. The bell boy jerked his thumb delightedly at Randy. And many times I thank you. Fifty times eleven, I thank you. You see, if I am shut up in a drum, it is impossible for me to answer the master's ring if he needs me. And he needs me now, I know it, I know it. But how can he call you unless he has the dinner bell? asked Randy, edging closer. Did Jenike take the bell with him when... To save himself, Randy could not finish the dismal sentence. When Glutwig pushed him into the sea, you mean? Ginger's brown face puckered up again. But controlling his sobs with great effort, he sat down on the edge of the drum and told him the whole story of Jinnicky's mischance and misfortunes. The master, as you know, explained Ginger, his eyes rolling sideways as he caught sight of Planety and Thun, whose like he had never seen in his entire magic existence. The master is always kind and jolly and unsuspecting. This Glutwig was the manager of a ruby mines and one of Jinnicky's most trusted officers. But all the time, this viper, this snake, this villainous black snake, Ginger clenched his fists and kicked his heels angrily against the drum, was planning to steal a red jinn's throne and magic, in addition to his own splendid mansion and fortune. One evening, seven moons ago, having trained his miners into an army of rebellion, Glodwick marched upon our castle and drove everybody out. Everybody? The elegant elephant, picking Ginger up in his trunk, looked earnestly into his face. Everybody, repeated the little bellboy, wagging his turban surfully. 
Ali Babel, the Grand Advizier, all the members of the court and household were sent to the mines under the cruel rule of Glubdo, Ludwig's brother, and they are there now, working without rest, hope or reward. He marched the master to the head of the highest cliff and pushed him violently into the sea with his own hands. Ginger began to tremble with grief and anger at the memory of it all. He ordered the bandsmen to seal me up in this drum, knowing a drum is the only place from which I cannot escape, and hoping I will shrivel up and perish. But I, I said to the little black triumphantly, I am the best part of Jinniki's magic, so he couldn't destroy me. A quick grin overspread Ginger's face. And he could not destroy my master either. Of that I am sure. And now that the elephant so elegant has let me out, now... Now what? breathed Randy, almost afraid Ginger was not going to tell him. You see, Ginger, we came to visit the Red Jinn, and were immediately captured and dumped down here ourselves. So how can we get out? And what can we do? I will think of something, promised the bellboy. Wriggling out of Kabumpa's trunk, he scurried across the cellar and disappeared beneath an overturned wheelbarrow. So, he will think of something, sniffed Kabumpo, trying not to make it sound too sarcastic. Well, of course, that settles it. And while he is thinking, I intend to take a nap. I'm completely worn out with all these vile plots and villainies. I too will rest, decided Planety, reaching over to pat the thunder cold. The strange excitements of the day had wearied the little princess, and this last story of Ginger's had still further puzzled and distressed her. I never thought when I brought you here you'd have to sleep in a place like this, groaned Randy, glancing ruefully round the dingy basement. Oh, it's not so bad, smiled the little princess. Slipping off her cape, she swung it casually between two grimy pillars, and with the handbag tucked under her arm, climbed contentedly into her silver bed. Good night, Randy and Bumpo, dear, she called softly. I believe I shall read for a long, long time. Now what does she mean by that? worried the young king, as the princess blew them each a wistful kiss. Something's wrong, Kabumpo, I feel it. And look there at Thun, why is he acting so strangely, almost as if he could not see? Look at him, look at him, well, the elegant elephant. Where is he? How can I? It's dark as thunder in here now. Great grump, Randy, I can't see you, him, or anything at all. Stumbling and tripping, he somehow crossed the cellar to the spot where he remembered Thun had been. Then, as his trunk struck against the hard cold metal, he recoiled in horror. He's out, moaned the elegant elephant hoarsely. He's not even breathing. Why, he's cold and stiff as stone. Oh, good grump, the cold saved my life, and now what can I do for him? What will we do, Randy? I say, what will we do? Randy had no answer at all, for moved by a dreadful foreboding, he leaned down to touch the face of the little princess of another planet, only to find it still and cold. No sparkling light radiated from Planety now, as quiet and motionless as a statue, she lay wrapped in her silver nets. Ginger, where are you? Ginger, come help us! Randy screamed desperately. Scrambling out from under the barrow, the startled bellboy reached Randy's side in a split second, for Ginger could see as well in the dark as in the daytime. Did Glodwick do this? he panted, his eyes rolling wildly from Panetti to the frozen thunder cold. No, no, they are far from their own country and need the powerful vanadium springs, groaned Kabumpo, putting out his trunk to touch the little princess. They cannot exist down here, and with Jinniki gone, who's to help them? His tears fell thick and fast on Planety's silver tresses. Then why do we stay here? shouted Ginger, tugging at Randy's cloak and Kabumpo's robe. Why do we stay? As if to answer Ginger's mournful cry, there was a long whistling rustle in the air, and the next moment Randy, Ginger, Kabumpo, and the princess of another planet were wafted, like feathers through the night, passing easily as mist through the narrow glass windows up over the castle itself, and out over the silvery moonlit sea. End of chapter 14「Chapter 15 of The Silver Princess in Oz – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge 
The Silver Princess in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter 15. Nonagon Island. The same afternoon the four travelers arrived at the Red Jinn's castle. A lonely fisherman in an odd nine-sided dory pulled out from the Nonagon Isle. This strange small nine-sided island lies about ninety leagues from the mainland of Ev. Flat, barren, and rocky, it affords but a meager living to the nine fishermen who are its sole inhabitants. Each keeps strictly to his own side of the island, subsisting frugally on fish and the few poor vegetables he can grow in his rocky little garden. Hard and unfriendly as their island itself, the nine nonagans go their own ways, exchanging brief nods on the rare occasions when they meet one another. The habit of silence had so grown upon Bloff, the fisherman in the nine-sided dory, he did not even talk to the cat who shared his rough dwelling and accompanied him on all of his fishing trips. And so accustomed was poor Nina to her gruff and taciturn master that she expected nothing from him but an occasional kick or fish head. Never sure which would be forthcoming, she kept her green eyes watchfully upon him at all times. This afternoon she was certain it would be a fish head, and as Bloff reached the spot where he had set his nets, her tail began to wave gently in pleasant anticipation. Bloff himself seemed a little less grim, for the net seemed quite heavy, and sure he had made a good haul, he began pulling on the lines. But when his net came wet and dripping over the side of the boat, he gave a grunt of anger. In it were only three small fish and an immense red jug. His first impulse was to toss the jug back into the sea, but reflecting grumpily that he could use it to salt down fish for the winter, he rolled it into the bottom of the boat, and kicking the disappointed cat out of the way, rowed rapidly back to the island. Stamping into his nine-sided shack with a net over his shoulder, Bloff banged the jug down on the hearth, cleaned and cut up the fish, and popped them into a pot hung on a crane over the fire. Then, lighting his one poor lamp, he sat sullenly down to wait for his supper. The fish heads he flung cruelly into the hot ashes, and whenever he dozed for a moment Nina tried to pull one out with her paw, for she knew full well she could get nothing else to eat. For perhaps an hour there was not a sound in the fisherman's hut except the crackling of the driftwood in the grate and the hoarse breathing of the fisherman himself. Then suddenly Nina, who had almost succeeded in dragging her supper from the flames, gave a frightened backward leap. "'Oh, my, mercy me, mercy me!' came a muffled but merry voice. "'Where, but where am I now?' As Nina and her master turned startled eyes toward the red jug, for the voice was undoubtedly coming from the jug, the lid slowly lifted, and a round jolly face peered out at them. What he saw was so discouraging. Jinnicky, for of course it was Jinnicky, dropped back out of sight. The magic fluid with which he had sealed himself in the jug before Gludwig hurled him into the sea had been melted by the warmth of the fisherman's fire, and the same warmth had restored the little red gin to his usual vigor and liveliness. In a sort of protective stupor he had managed to survive the long months at the bottom of the ocean. A quick thinker at all times, Jinnicky rapidly regained his senses and realized at once what had happened. A fortunate tide had carried him into this fisherman's net, and at last he was on dry land again, and now to find and face the villain who had usurped his throne and castle. But why, why, groaned the little gin dolefully, with all the fishermen in the nonastic ocean, did I have to be pulled out by this long-jawed fellow? Venturing another look, and at the same time thrusting his arms and legs out of their proper apertures in the jug, he saw that Bloff, had seized an oar and seemed about ready to whack it down on his head. "'Non, non, non, my good fellow,' puffed Jinnicky, fixing his rescuer with his bright glassy eye. "'Put up your oar. This is no battle, and I have much to say that will interest you. But first of all I want to thank you for pulling me out of the ocean. Heartily, heartily. 
A suitable reward will be sent you as soon as I get back, um, get back my castle. To this polite speech, Bluff paid no attention whatsoever. But Nina, liking the pleasant voice of this curious visitor, began rubbing herself against his ankles. "'I am the Red Jinn of Ev,' announced the little wizard, keeping a wary eye on the oar. "'At present, banished from my castle by the treachery of a trusted officer.' "'In fact,' Jinnicky tapped himself smartly on the jug, "'this villain actually took everything I had and tossed me into the sea.' "'What's wrong with the sea?' inquired the fisherman hoarsely. Never having seen any one in his whole life but the eight other Nonagon Islanders, Bloff did not really believe what he saw now. "'I'm asleep and having a nightmare,' he concluded, grasping the oar more determinedly still. "'And we can hardly blame him, for a fellow whose body is a huge red vase, into which he can draw his arms, legs, and head at will, is pretty hard for anyone to believe.' Realizing he was getting nowhere, and that his grim and dour rescuer cared nothing about his troubles, past or present, Jinnicky decided to try another line. "'Perhaps you could tell me the name of this place, and your own name,' he murmured politely. "'I am Bluff, my cat is Nina, and this is the Nonagon Island,' announced the fisherman, frowning at the little wizard. "'Ah, a nine-sided island!' The red jinn stretched his arms and hopped up and down to get the kinks out of his legs. And I see you have a nine-sided cottage and a cat with nine lives. Picking up poor skinny Nina, who was purring for the first time in her life, Jinnicky stroked her back thoughtfully as he counted the nine pieces of furniture in the rude hut, noted that it was nine o'clock and the ninth of May. But is nine my lucky number? he pondered wearily. Could this churlish fisherman ever be persuaded to sail him back to the mainland? Looking at Bluff out of the side of his eye, he very much doubted it. Though Bluff had put down the oar, his manner was anything but cordial. "'Are there any other people on the island?' asked Jinnicky, more to keep up the conversation than because he really wanted to know. At his question, Bluff put back his head, and in a long sing-song voice drawled, Bluff, bliff, bleef, blaff, bluff, blaff, bloof, and bloof. Oh, my, mercy me! At each name, Jinnicky gave a little jump, and as Bluff came to the end of the list, he seated himself gingerly on the edge of the bench and stared into the fire. What could he hope from such people? Then suddenly, in the midst of his worries, he became aware of the fish chowder bubbling cozily on the crane, and realized at the same instant his enormous and devouring hunger. After all, you know, he had not eaten for seven months. Ah, he beamed, extending both arms toward his host. Dinner! My dinner! The two words were spoken so gruffly, Jinnicky's heart fell with a loud clunk into his boots. Why, this was unbelievable! He, Jinnicky, the one and only Wizard of Ev, to be flouted and insulted by a miserable fisherman. Well, at least he could leave the fellow's miserable hut and try his luck with the other islanders. Reflecting sadly that a wizard without his magic is no better off than any other man, the red jinn slid off the bench and started for the door, trying to walk in a calm and dignified manner. But halfway there, a sharp grunt brought him up short. Oh, ho, oh, no you don't, rasped Bluff, catching up with him in two strides. Where do you think you're going? Stop! I need that jug to salt my fish. Here, give it to me. Why, you, you miserable mollusk! Don't you dare touch me, panted the red jinn, trying to beat off the fisherman with his puny hands. This jug is an important part of me. Without my jug, I cannot live at all. And do you think I care for that, sneered Bluff. You're just an old lobster in a pot to me. Here, give me that jug. Seizing Jinnicky by both arms, Bluff tried to shake him out of the jug. Nina, enraged at such barbarous treatment of the only one who had ever been kind to her, proved an unexpected ally. Flying at the fisherman, she began to scratch and claw his face and hands so successfully, Bluff had to drop Jinnicky to grab the cat. 
The force of the drop sent the red gin rolling over and over, dislodging a small silver bell from a hidden pocket in his sleeve. As the bell fell tinkling to the flagstones, Jinnicky gave a bounce of relief. His magic dinner bell, and up his sleeve all the time. How had he ever forgotten it? Oh, now, now, if Ginger had not been destroyed by Gludwig and just answered the bell, everything would be different. And Ginger did answer the bell, and everything was different. My, yes, so different. Bloff threw the cat at Jinnicky and simply raced for the door. No wonder in his small nine-sided shack were now an elephant carrying a silvery princess in his trunk, a black boy in a tall turban, and a white boy in a sparkling crown. With one more terrified glance, Bloff took to his heels and never stopped running till he was waist-high in the Nonestic Ocean. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of The Silver Princess in Oz This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge The Silver Princess in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson Chapter 16 All Together at Last Kabumpo! Kabumpo! Randy! Oh, my mercy me! Rolling to his feet, Jinnicky tottered over to the hearth, and encountering Ginger halfway there, clasped his faithful bellboy to his shiny glass bosom. As soon as that bell rang, I knew everything was going to be better, he puffed, and I rather expected Ginger, but you! Why, my dear old Gaboscus, fancy meeting you here! But I don't fancy it at all, grunted Kabumpo, placing the sleeping princess gently down on the fisherman's bench, and glancing disgustedly round the mean little hut. How in Ev did you ever happen to be in such a place? And how did you get here, and where in Oz are we, anyway? Oh, Jinnicky, are you really all right? Grasping the little wizard by both arms, Randy examined him carefully from top to toe. Kabumpo and I came to see you, and instead of you, there was Gludwig in your castle. He told us you were at the bottom of the sea, and after first trying to destroy us with his army, he flung us into the castle basement. There we found Ginger sealed up in a big drum, and we let him out, and after a while, in a way I cannot figure out at all, we find ourselves here. How did it happen? Why, Ginger brought you, of course. Releasing the little black boy from his tight embrace, Jinnicky planted a huge kiss on his ebony forehead, and with a flashing grin the slave of the bell vanished into space. Don't worry. He's always going, but he'll come back any time I ring the bell. You must all have been touching Ginger when the bell rang, so naturally when Ginger answered the bell, he brought you right along. Nothing natural about it, fumed Kabumpo, drawing his trunk wearily across his forehead. But you haven't told us how you got here, said Randy, bending over Planity to see that she had made the trip without coming to any harm. And what is that, pray, demanded the little djinn, eyeing the sleeping princess with round, astonished eyes. Something you brought me for a present? A pretty little idol you've stolen from some heathen temple? My mercy me, what a beauty it is! I'll mount it on a ruby pedestal and worship it all the rest of my days. Oh, no, Jinnicky, no! Randy's voice broke, and he could not utter another word, try as he would. In puzzled concern, the red djinn turned to Gabumpo. She's not a present, but she's an idol, all right. Randy's idol, and he intends to spend the rest of his life worshipping her, if I read the signals aright, said Kabumpo dryly. There you see the princess of another planet, old boy, and up to an hour ago she was as live and bright and happy as any of us. But what happened to her? Oh, my, mercy me, another mystery. Jinnicky clasped his hands in genuine distress. Well, you tell us what happened to you, and then we'll tell you what happened to her and us, offered Kabumpo. That is, if we don't die of hunger first. Hunger? Jinnicky swallowed four times in rapid succession. Oh, my mercy, me and us! You do not even know the meaning of the word. 
I have not eaten a bite for seven months, but har, 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 that is all over now. With my magic dinner bell right at hand, why should anyone be hungry? Four dinners and at once, beamed the red gin, ringing it smartly. See, my dear, I've not even forgotten you. Jinnicky leaned down to stroke Nina, who had hidden behind the hearth brush when so many strangers came dropping into the hut. This valiant Nonagon puss fought bravely in my defense, and has thereby earned herself a place in my heart and castle for all the rest of her nine natural lives. But first you must get back your castle, said Kabumpo, as Jinnicky began dancing up and down the room, the miserable cat hugged tightly in his arms. Even Randy had to smile at that. No one could be around the little gin and stay sorrowful. And worried as he was over Planety and Thun, the young king could not help feeling that now they were together, everything was going to turn out right. Somehow and way, Jinnicky would help them. "'Isn't this like old times?' he beamed, bustling around like a busy host, as Ginger, with four enormous trays balanced on his head, flashed down, set an appetizing dinner before each of the company, and melted away like smoke up the chimney. For Nina he had brought nine saucers of cream and some minced chicken. For Kabumpo, a huge bowl of assorted nuts and another bowl of cut raw vegetables, each bowl capable of replenishing itself, so that there was enough for even an elephant. For Randy and Jinnicky there were the finest of roast duck dinners. So, forgetting their mean surroundings and Gludwig's wickedness, the three royal wayfarers fell to and ate with an abandon and gusto that would have astonished their own castle holds and footmen. Nina, lapping up her rich and plenteous viands, seemed to grow fat and content before their very eyes, and while they dined, Jinnicky explained how he had been tricked by Gludwig, pulled out of the sea by Bloff, and then nearly shaken out of his jar by the surly fisherman, who at the same time had shaken out the bell and brought him assistance. "'Where is he? Wait till I get my trunk on him,' raged Kabumpo, glancing sharply round the nine-sided shack. Jinnicky, on his part, when he discovered how Gludwig had treated his friends and visitors, was no less enraged and indignant. "'Used my very own patented trap floor on you, did he? Ha! Wait, I'll fix him!' Beating his small hands angrily together, Jinnicky's eyes burned with a bright red hatred. "'Yes, we were floored, all right,' admitted the elegant elephant, pushing away his two bowls, for at last he had had enough. And while Randy and the Red Gin were finishing their suppers, he told the whole story of their journey through Oz and Ev and Ix, of their meeting with Planety and Thun, and the sad fate that had overtaken these loyal comrades in the Red Castle, when they could no longer avail themselves of their own Vanadium Springs.' Vanadium, murmured the red gin, resting his head in his chubby hands. I believe I could make a substitute for that. Why, in my laboratory. Yes, but this isn't your laboratory, sighed Randy. And however are we to get off this nine-sided island if all the fishermen are as hateful as Bloff? Har, har, har. Now that is the least of our troubles. Jinnicky waved airily to the owner of the cottage, whose glum face had just appeared in the window. Ginger shall carry us back as easily as he carries the trays. First I shall ring the dinner bell. Then when Ginger appears I shall hang on to his coat. You, Randy, must hang on to me, and Kabumpo, bless his big heart, shall hang on to you, being careful to hold the princess of this other planet in his trunk. Oh, my mercy me, I'd almost forgotten the cat. Scooping up Nina, Jinnicky waited till the elegant elephant had lifted Planety in his trunk. Then, taking the silver bell from his sleeve, he gave it a cheerful tinkle. "'Ho, oh, this!' puffed the little gin, blowing a kiss to the glowering fisherman. "'This is the finest place to leave I've ever left in my whole life. "'Oh, my mercy me, you and us. "'Here's Ginger. Hold on, everybody. We're off.' And they were sailing along as smoothly behind the little slave of the bell as if they weighed nothing at all 
and leaving Bloff running in frantic circles round his hut, for he was now more convinced than ever that this was a nightmare, or that worse still he had taken entire leave of his wits and senses. End of chapter 16